Good afternoon and welcome back to our third and final day of GridX for 20, GridX days rather, for 2022. We've had an amazing last two days focusing on the status quo, sustainability issues and the different trends facing the energy industry. Today, we're focusing on technological solutions, innovation, skills gap, whole bunch of really interesting stuff. So we're really excited to dive into the topics. And I obviously have a special guest here with me today. So thanks for joining us today, David. Thank you. Great being here. Good. Okay, I'll introduce the topic and then uh, <laughs> we'll uh, introduce David as well. So PwC State of Climate Tech study showed that investment in climate tech grew by 210% from the first half of 2020 to 2021. And of 3,000 climate techs identified across the world, 78 unicorns emerged. Is this how we should measure success? And with so many startups, new ideas and technologies emerging, how can we identify what is really important? What has true potential? And what will really aid us in enabling the energy transition? To find that out, we have David Balanzifan with us here, who is co-founder and managing director of GridX. David launched a technology that connects all types of decentralized energy resources and makes it possible to optimize energy flows in any context. He's on a mission to revolutionize the energy sector and enable a world based on clean energy. Thanks for being here, David. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> and with him, we have Tim Schumacher, who has been an entrepreneur since he was a kid when he got his first computer and started coding. He's founded and led several companies, including Sado.com, IO.com, and most recently, SARS Group. He's passionate about investing in startups and mentoring the next generation of climate tech founders. Together with Ecosia, he's building up World Fund, where he is managing general partner. Tim, welcome to the panel. Hello, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. We also have Anna Marie de Jong, who's an award-winning growth-minded leader, motivational speaker, and tech advisor. She was the chief commercial officer at Solar Monkey in the Netherlands and recently joined JumpTech as country manager for Germany, responsible for opening up and growing the DAF market to accelerate the worldwide adoption of EVs and clean technologies. JumpTech provides a software platform that simplifies the EV charge point installation process. Anna Marie, welcome and thanks for joining us. Wonderful, thank you. All right, we were also supposed to be joined with by Christoph Ostermann, but unfortunately due to family reasons, he couldn't join us today. So the three of us will be diving into the discussion. Tim, to start off with, what do you look for when trying to find the next big thing? Yeah, so we look for companies um, that really move the needle on decarbonization. Um, we look for companies that can save at least 100 megatons. Um, and that's hard to measure because sometimes it's super indirect. I mean, take Gridex, for example, is like, it's like, you can't say, okay, it's exactly like that. But basically through the work you do in the decentralized world, uh, you, you obviously have a profound interest, uh, uh, profound impact. And that's exactly the type of things we look for is, is like what. What really moves the needle? Uh, what are things that can um, change decarbonization and in in, um, in in the energy world, but also in other in our, in our case, we also invest in other things, building transportation. I mean, it's all very closely connected. Uh, but also things like food, agriculture, and land use, uh, where you have huge impacts. Um, and and we believe, and that's that's basically the general hypothesis of World Fund. We believe that those will be the winners of the next decade as the world uh, decarbonizes and has to decarbonize and well, hopefully does so. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And David, what are the major growing pains experienced by fast growing companies and how can these be overcome? Uh, yeah, a rather good question. Since Curix is my first job, I only have um, a sample number of one. Um, but of course, um, I'm, I'm in a lot of exchange with other founders. But to be honest, I think with, ever, with every um, fast-growing company, there comes a lot of challenges and pains. Um, yeah, maybe starting with one, I think it's really culture. Um, because um, if you're growing quite fast, um, it's all about um, maintaining the culture and also developing the culture in a positive way. Uh, so I think that's a big challenge also for the recruiting and employer planning team to kind of find the right talent. Um, and also, I think it's more important to hire for 
character and then train for skills. So I think that's really a big pain in, in current organization. Then probably like a uh, lack of transparency, because I think as a, as a small company, um, everybody knows kind of what the other teams are doing. Um, and then suddenly you're, you have departments and larger teams and organization. Um, so you can kind of feel inefficiencies and in, in meeting culture. And of course, then you need you no know, processes and so on. I think that's um, sometimes quite painful. Um, and at the end, I would also say um, internal communication is sometimes pretty hard to align everyone on a constant base. What is our kind of um, yeah ultimate vision, how to get there and to really align every team member, um, the whole team to achieve our mission, our vision. Uh, so I think um, I would assume these are kind of the main challenges every company are facing in this kind of stage. But I think there are co countless other challenges. And I think Tim, with his experience, also I Marie, they can uh, sing some songs about that. Uh, and also, I think uh, Tim helped us quite uh, quite a bit in the past to overcome the challenges. Mm -hmm. Anna Marie, would you add anything to that? As you have a bit of experience with scaling companies as well. Oh, oh uh, it, well, first of all, you know, it's it's a it's a ride, and I think everyone who joins a scale up or a startup, you know, buckle up and enjoy the ride. You're going to do things you've never experienced, uh, never thought you'd have to do, and you need to be willing to get your hands dirty. Because I think what's really, really important, you know, is we're doing it all together. And uh, if it means that you have to move desks, you move desks. If it means that you have to answer customer queries, you answer customer queries. Now, I think an important element, and which is also often a growing pain, is, is the burn rate. Uh, something not spoken about so much, but, you know, uh, keep the burn rate in mind. Um, and, and also explain why that's important, you know, because... The, the reality is startups is not only unicorns, there are also failures. And if you look at the failures and why people have failed, it's also, it, it, maybe, of course, it was a product market fit issue. But it's also sometimes that I see, you know, spending money is easy. But uh, that, that doesn't mean that your company will be sustainable. And I think that that mindset and that awareness is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Tim, what would your response to that be, that spending money is easy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Anna Marie, you're right. I mean, that mindset uh, that spending money is easy and you shouldn't maybe just spend it because VC money is always there. That uh, fortunately comes back. Um, my my first company was started in 2001. I started that right right after finishing university, and that was like the worst time to raise funding. Uh, the the dot com boost, the dot com market had just just collapsed, and um, but then it went up, up, up until kind of 2008. <laughs> So there was financial crisis, but then since for the last 12 years, it only went up. So until kind of the first Corona dip 2020, which was a really like short dip, people have never experienced that, that things will also go at that maybe you cannot raise funds anymore. And so it's kind of the first time when people actually realize, okay, running a company in the long run means that you have to uh, make as much money uh, as, as you spend, or ideally uh, even make a little more than you spend. Yeah. yeah, building up on that, I also think, you know, scaling companies and, and growing internationally, um, that's the wish of everyone. You want to go everywhere, yeah. you to convince everyone, there's so much potential, you know, you have this brilliant idea, but focus, 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 mm -hmm. focus, and focus. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we, if we and uh, David, you also touched upon that, you know, one of the growing pains of, of startups is that there's so much opportunity, you're so enthusiastic, but be careful that you don't burn yourself and, and really bring the right focus. And if that means opening up another market one year later, but being very successful at it, mm. because the other market, you, you had some more time, you took the learnings. I think that's sometimes more important. And that's also what I see when I talk to startups. You know, sometimes that you can't be too hungry, right? We have to change the world. We want to make an impact. But sometimes, you know, taking a one extra pace, helps. And let's talk a little bit more specifically about the challenges in the climate tech space. Does it make it easier that people feel like they can have an impact in, through their jobs or are there specific challenges in this area that, you know, might not apply to other industries? Tim, what do you think? So there are different challenges. I mean, some things are exactly the same. So, I mean, the things uh, <coughs> you, you've said uh, about uh, the, the the difficulties of scaling a companies, I would say they're exactly the same, whether you have a climate startup or a non-climate startup. 
um, culture issues, the scaling issues, uh, having to delegate uh, funding, all of that. But then there are other things which are very peculiar. So one thing, for example, on the positive side is that it's really, it's, it's, it's really much easier to find great talent. Like a lot of people really want to work in this space. They don't want to create silly games and uh, take money out of teenagers' pockets, but they really want to move the world to the better. And, and so I'm seeing both from experienced entrepreneurs, but also from um, young aspiring founders, I see a, a huge shift from people doing use, useless stuff over to climate, which is really, really good. But then there's also a danger because sometimes people forget that it ha- those things have to make economic sense. And yeah. when you're like in, in our climate bubble, you tend to forget that there is a whole world out there which says, okay, how much does it cost? How much does it bring? And if you don't have the right business model, then you can be enthusiastic and climate positive all day long, but it won't move the needle. Um, uh, and you're not getting out of your bubble and you will never really find customers uh, apart from those like super enthusiastic adopters. And that's a real kind of that struggle is a real danger. And you have to watch out for that and make sure that you actually build something which you can sell to everyone or, and, and that's going to be my last sentence. I sometimes jokingly say the best climate tech solutions are the ones you can sell to climate change deniers. Um, <laughs> and that should be the basis for kind of any business model. Yeah. I, I love that. What you say there. I mean, uh, what, what came to my mind was, you know, it's not a charity, even if you work yeah. in, in climate tech, you know, it, we have, you have to, it has to make market sense. There needs to be an audience and you need to solve a problem. And I, I, I think I'll keep that one. You know, you need to be able to convince climate deniers because, uh, yeah, we need everyone on board. And just jumping on that a little bit more, Tim, at the beginning, you said you look for companies that uh, reduce a certain number of emissions, mm-hmm. but then it obviously also has to make economic sense at the same time. So how do you kind of balance those two needs? Well, the good thing is that is it is very often balanced. It's like to, to us, decarbonization uh, is a predictor for financial return. If, if you save a lot of carbon, you usually also save a lot of energy. And if you, that means you save money. Uh, or for example, we've got one, uh, taken uh, another example from the non-energy world, we've got one startup in the World Fund is uh, they, they reduce um, food waste by smarter ordering for supermarkets. And people might think it's a small problem. It's actually a huge one. Like there's so much fruit and vegetables are wasted every day. And, and that means if you reduce food waste, your profitability shoots up as a supermarket. Um, and so um, then, then it's a very profitable thing. And so very often those things are, are very much aligned. It's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. And so after a company scales, David, what sort of pathways do startups have of being bought out by giants, IPOing, and how do you know what the right path is? I, I think there are so many options and it really depends again on the business and, and what they need. Uh, so I think for, for some companies, it can makes totally sense to get bought by any major other company. Um, but of course, I think IPOs, just like one other source of getting additional funding is in case the private market market is not providing enough funding um, to these kind of companies. Um, so it, it really depends on where you go and what you do. Um, I think especially for the energy market, it sometimes makes sense to go with bigger ones uh, because um, due to heavy regulation in certain respective markets, uh, so that's not easy uh, to kind of change uh, things. Uh, yeah, I think we we at critics we know it quite well uh, that if it comes to any crit operation topics, it gets uh, very, I would say, uh, bureaucratic. Um, so therefore, to really have impact and and yeah, also the option and the possibility to to change, it can make sense. But um, yeah, I think it's it's always the question of your own business um, at and what at the end you want to do. And it's not always driven by just the founders. In case you take VC money, of course, it's also driven by um, investors. And of course, they're looking for kind of a return at at, at one hand, like after 10 years or 12 years, whatever. Um, so um, yeah, I think quite early on, you kind of decide with your um, cap table, what kind of route you're going, um, whether it's kind of a bootstrapped company or a funded company. But yeah, I think there are plenty of options. And Tim, what would your perspective there be on the on the other side of that? 
I, I, I would agree. It, there, there are plenty of options. And I think it's always important that any path, so it, the path starts with the beginning, what type of funding you look, what company structure you have, that that fits both the industry and your business model and also the founder profile. And, and let, let me make this more concrete. So there are industries where you have to grow super fast. There are strong network effects. There's no way around venture capital. Um, you have to take money. You have to go the venture route. But then you're once you're in the venture in the venture capital hamster wheel, and I don't hamster wheel maybe sounds a little negative, but it it, it gives you a lot of pressure. But you also you have the chance to become one of the biggest in the world. But it's also not for everyone. Um, it's high risk, high return. Um, you're building something huge. On the other side, there is a real world out there with bootstrap companies. Uh, extreme example uh, could be uh, also purpose-based companies, nonprofit companies like Ecosia, for example, which we turned into a nonprofit at some point. Super solid, super strong companies, very value-driven. Um, but those you cannot build if you require a lot of funding along the way. Um, and also, as a founder, you need to know: like, is is the stress of VC for you? Do you and, and you are also are your ambitions big enough for that? If they are, then that's the best route to go. If they are not, you might be better in a more iterative world, also in an industry where you don't need to. Uh, there's no winner takes all, and so um, there there are a lot of questions. And I think people should also not be blinded by just funding rounds. That like company X has raised a hundred million is like yeah, fine, but it also often means that, um, well, you have to pay that money back at the end of the day. And so um, it's uh, it's not one size fits all, but it's really, there are a lot of good approaches. There are great venture capital-based companies, but there are also great bootstrap companies and they all deserve recognition in, in their own way and uh, for, for the success uh, of the founders. Maybe to add on that, um, I think there are sometimes also kind of the dilemma, if you raise a bunch of money, um, especially in, in a world where you want to change and have purpose with your company, um, you kind of get sometimes forced to do the wrong stuff. Yeah. And mm -hmm. really told about expansion yeah? so that the, the investors expect a certain amount of return or growth um, numbers and rates. And I think, um, especially in the climate tech um, industry, or if you want to build a company in this kind of space, um, it's, it's all about um, having yeah, how you say it, um, uh, it's more like a marathon or even more because you can't change the world from, from today day to tomorrow. It's really about um, a long time. And I think uh, taking the, the wrong routes and, and getting pressured to do that, I think it, it can be um, sometimes the death of a, of a startup and a company. So um, I think that's really like finding the, the right balancing act between um, investors that also have like the long-term vision um, and also to have create a sustainable impact and um, also in terms of return, but also in terms of um, impact on the society and the, and, the, and the earth. Yeah. That segues very nicely into my next question, Anna Marie. We've talked a bit about how we can measure success, um, particularly for scales up, scale ups. Um, how difficult is it to kind of maintain that focus on a company's North Star, particularly as it grows and other challenges arise? Do you have any sort of experience or tips? Oh, um, I think what's really important is that you you remember what you're doing it for and what's the like big, hairy, audacious goal. And of course, you have all the day to day things that run. But I, I think it's very important. And that's a tip I'd give is to, you know, have a regular meeting where you look at your top goal once every six weeks, every quarter, what you want, and see, are we still steering towards that? I sometimes laughingly make the joke, you know, if you're in the middle of the ocean, I mean, the whole crew thinks you're going to Canada, but if you change the degrees all the time, you end up in Cuba. And uh, yeah, and it's because you're not reaching or going for that North Star. And that happens a lot because you're distracted, because there's opportunity. Uh, so I think, you know, first of all, having that conversation on a frequent basis, and also, you know, a little bit of deviation isn't bad as long as you're going back on your course. So I think that that's that's tip one. Have regular meetings and talk about are we still doing that? And then, of course, you know, the, the classical measures, you know, um, how are, how many customers are you acquiring? Customer acquisition costs, you know, was the revenue uh, very important? Retention, you know, uh, are you on the right track? I, I think uh, if you're in a boat in the middle of the ocean, to keep uh, with the analogy, 
and at the end all oh, everyone falls out you have a problem so also there you know keep looking am i on the right track am i in the right type of boat um what's your burn rate and i think one that's really most important how are the people in my company doing because at the end of the day i think the most important value uh inside your company is the people that work for you and if you see that a half of your crew are getting a burnout or they're really very tired you know and a lot of people are leaving and they're not motivated then you're doing something wrong and if we talk about measuring success i don't think people is a factor that's often looked at in the classical you know slides and things you have to fill in but it is one of the most important ones yeah thanks anna marie and tim Obviously, this is kind of a million dollar question and, you know, we wish we all knew this, but good <clears throat> ideas are one thing. Identifying true potential is another. What are, You talked a little bit about it at the beginning, but how can you really identify if something will grow and be successful in the future? I mean, that's, that's, that's super hard. I mean, and, and I mean, I've been doing climate investments for a long time now, uh, even before my fund. Um, and uh, of course, I've had quite a few failures as well where i thought you know hey this is going to be great i mean it's it's always a mix of things it's it, it starts with the people i think uh, as as everybody would say it's it the people are more important than anything because a great team even if they start off on the wrong foot uh, they will pivot to a business model um, which will work um, while a strong team might be in the right market but they'll be overrun by a better team so it starts off with the people i always look for is it is it a, um, a complementary team? So is it strong both on the technical front, but also um, on the business uh, and sales front? Um, because you don't want people who just kind of fiddle in their laboratory uh, and never sell anything. You also don't want to have sellers who just go around and tell how great they are, but they don't have anything. So you really want to have the combination of both. Um, then, um, I mean, business model is important. Um, I think really, as, as I said earlier, having a business model, which is so strong that you can, uh, even if you have a climate impact, sell it to climate change deniers, because it is it is about the economic benefit, but it's also about the ease of the solution. Uh, there might be an economic benefit if the hurdles are so big. Uh, David, you alluded a little bit to that, that you said the energy world is very slow to transition. And, and I think that is that is a challenge because sometimes you think like, oh, you know, this is a no brainer to do this, but then, well, the big energy companies for them, it's like a footnote and they could care less. And uh, so you always have to think, even if, you, if the business model is right, how easy it is to convince the right people who are the decision makers, why is the industry as slow as they are? And uh, really thinking about your go-to market strategy um, in, in a way. And then I mean, I always look about passion, um, uh, the, 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 the marathon approach, uh, which has been mentioned here is, is okay, if you really need to have the passion for, to run this company for five, 10 years, uh, because like there is really no such thing as an overnight success. It always comes with a lot of work and a lot of pain. And, and so I, I really always want to understand is the founder really intrinsically motivated uh, to do what he or she does or is is it more like, okay, I'm going to try this and if it doesn't work out, then next year I'll do something else. And um, so it's really a mix of things, um, which I think are success-based. And that's the that's the ingredient. And then, of course, you build a company a culture. I agree, Anna-Marie is super important. It's like you, you are a role model as a founder. And, and if you're able to build this, then, then um, I think you have all the recipes for success. Nice. Thanks, Tim. Would David or Anna-Marie, would you want to add anything to that? No, I think the only question I, I, I would have to Tim is how do how do you know what is like at the beginning the right business model? Huh? So I think um, if you look at critics, for instance, we started completely on the other hand, uh, on the other, other side and then kind of pivoted early on. And um, I think just I think we are at kind of day one uh, of many, many decades of, of climate innovation. And I think it's very hard to predict what what is nowadays the right business model. Uh, so I would challenge that. I think it's more uh, identifying the market potential in the future, and also I think having the right team, and um, that also can be stressed uh, because it won't go always up. It will be go down probably like quite a bit. Uh, so I think it's more about the team and then the business model. Hopefully, if they do like um, the right um, product market fit approach, uh, they will identify the right business model. 
um, in, in the next years and the pro can potentially also uh, change. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, that I don't know how you do that, Tim, but uh, seeing what is the right business model from the beginning on, but I think that's uh, that could be interesting. Yeah, I think it's both. It's I think you need you you're right that the business model can absolutely change. I think it's the market potential is one thing, but then I think the business the initial business model is always your initial go to market. You're saying, okay, this is the huge opportunity. That, but then also as a founder, it's wrong to say, okay, we're gonna address this huge opportunity head on and we're gonna do everything. But you out of this big opportunity, do you do one thing and you're essentially say, okay, I'm gonna start this way and start with this one thing. But if that works out, I can take my business model and go to A, B, C, and D. And then actually in reality, you might notice that your initial business model isn't the right thing, but you might pick business model B. Um, and I think that's that's what, as a, as a venture capitalist, you try to understand in this initial discussion, um, if, if you're actually able as a founder to, uh, to, to see both the abstract big potential, but also, the very clear go-to-market um, in the very beginning. And, and uh, you, you can, as a founder, you can do both things wrong. You can address the market way too big at the beginning and just fail, or you can stay in your niche and never see what the actual real market potential is. And um, so the, the real art is, is kind of doing, doing both at the same time. Oh. I agree, David. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And uh, when it comes to scaling, David, do you think there is such a thing as too fast? How can you kind of identify the tipping point? Ooh, um, good question. I, I would probably say a proxy are um, customer complaints and also probably product quality and then also employee complaints at a certain point. Um, I think that's that you can really feel and sense whether you grew too fast or not. Um, I remember back when we did like our first uh, angel round in 2016, uh, we met um, a business engine. He always said like a rule of thumb is don't grow faster than 2x on your headcount because at a certain point, you bring more new people in the company that you have an, as an existing base and foundation also culture wise. Um, and yeah, I, I would say um, so. We grew this year um, kind of two x, and uh, yeah, I think it's it's working quite quite well. But uh, I would believe growing much faster than that, also in terms of headcount. Even it, it, I think the market is there. We could grow three x or something like that. But I think that's not sustainable. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are in the sustainable industry, but also we want to have a sustainable company. Uh, and also what Anmari said, caring about the people. Um, and I think that is probably like one one indicator that you grew too fast. Um, that also kind of then that the quality of your product and processes are not not that good anymore. Of course, at a certain point, it needs to be like that. Yeah, that you need to make compromises. Um, but I think that would be an indicator. Yeah, Anna Marie, would you add anything to that? Well, uh, you know, uh, growing too fast is at the moment used a lot. Uh, in the media and in the tech, right, to, to let off people because people say you hired too fast, you grew too fast. Look, I think there's an ambiguity to this one because sometimes you have a market momentum and you need to acquire as fast as you can the market, grow, you know, cover the land because, for example, if we look at EVs in three to five years, the landscape is going to look absolutely totally different. So if you don't do it now, you don't have two to three years. So sometimes you really need to go fast, full throttle, push push the metal. And, and that's hard, right? Because, yes, that could mean you, you grow too fast, but either you go fast or you die trying. So I, I do want to also bring that point you know, that's sometimes the challenging part in the in the in the startup world and in the scale up world. Um, I, I do agree with David that, you know, sometimes you you hear too many customer complaints. The product isn't good enough. But again, look at your North Star. And, I, you know, I've also in the past sometimes made very hard decisions that, you know, we had to grow fast. We had to roll out certain things. It did mean that I knew that in half a year down the line, I would get customer complaints, but it would get us to the next stage, which I needed. And I think one of the challenges in running a company is that you constantly have to balance that. You know, what do I do? What don't I do? I do believe it, you know, nowadays leading starts with why and explaining that because 
we have to assume and we know that all of our employees are super smart. You know, you've got something when you want to change the world or you want to make an impact, right? And so sometimes also explaining, look, we're going to do something that for you, for a lot of you will feel very unnatural and very painful, but we're still going to do it. And I know we'll get the complaints down the line, but it still makes sense. You've got to trust me is a conversation you also need to have instead of just pushing ahead as a leader. And then, yes, you can grow maybe too fast and, and learn and stumble along the way, but at least you tried. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anna Marie. Uh, we've had a question from the audience from Peter asking, where in the energy space do you see the biggest need for new players, ideas and solutions? Tim, would you have an answer to that? Well, I mean, David, you know the energy space even better than I do. Um, I mean, first, I, I would say to, to me, and that was quite an inspiration also when we started World Fund, um, something like Project Drawdown is a great inspiration. It's like you just scroll down the projects in the NSP energy space in Project Drawdown, and and that way you know you got a scientifically quantified idea of what actually moves the needle. Uh, I, so I would suggest that, that to Peter. Um, I mean, we ha we have our own um, we have our own hypothesis as World Fund uh, storage is a big is a topic we're looking at. Uh, anything, I mean, the the thing Gridix is in 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 decentralized energy resources in in so software and intelligence. There's a lot of movements there. Um, then uh, also in the IoT segment, when it comes to connecting things to uh, buildings, for example, um, is 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 a big lever. Um, I mean, there are countless things. It's just uh, energy has been so big. It's um, it's almost if you'd ask, is like what are the what are the right things in digitalization? You could also end up with like a hundred interesting use cases. But um, yeah, as I said, Project Drawdown I think is a good starting point of just seeing what, what's out there. David, what's your perspective on that? Um, I would agree with what Tim said. Um, what I really see sometimes um, also that investors are thinking about more theoretical solutions in the future. Um, but I, what I really see at the moment and also in the next years is we have a labor shortage. Uh, so um, fighting against climate change is al also a hardware labor problem. Uh, so I think we, we need to find a solution how to get very well-educated installers and so on very fast in, in the markets that they really can install the solutions that, that are, for instance, already there. Um, and I think um, finding kind of a new education program to bring more uh, craftsmen into the markets, I think it's it's very important because I, I see very great companies um, scaling solar panels and also better resources um, in, in in the markets, but still, it's if you compare how many units they're doing at the moment, it's 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 tiny. Yeah, so the market needs much more, and I think we can't afford to wait another ten years until the people are there. So I think it's really finding. I don't know. I don't have like a clear picture on that, but finding kind of an education program to really onboard fast people from um, outside areas to be this kind of um, expertise guys uh, so I, I really see that yeah we're actually talking about that later at oh, okay. uh, 4 30 <laughs> so um yeah but you know are there certain areas where incumbents are lacking the ability to innovate and do we need startups to kind of bring that really fast agile innovation yeah absolutely i think um the best i think a good example was or are like dynamic prices, energy prices. Uh, so I think it was um, sometimes smiled by the big ones uh, what the, the small startups are doing. But um, if you see suddenly like gas and, and electricity prices are kind of peaking, um, it, it's getting more and more mainstream that people are yeah, thinking about what's my electricity bill, who's behind it, how can I, can I optimize also in terms of um, being carbon neutral um, and yeah, um, I think that's that's one point and also um yeah yeah i think dynamic prices kind of new util uh, utilities um but also i think most of the trends um at the past came from small small startups and they kind of innovated and then forced the big ones to act and i think that's probably like you know how innovation is happening uh not not often done by the by the big tanks uh, mostly by the speedboats 
uh, and then it kind of taken over at a certain point when it's uh, market ready by by the big big ones. Yeah. Anna Marie, would you have anything to add to that? I often say that the future is exciting, but I do think if we look ahead, you know, to this winter or to the coming day, uh, the coming years, we are it's it's not like, you know, only growth, you know, it, it, and what I'm really looking forward to is also innovation for the for everyone, you know, because we, we have a huge problem in, in the housing and how to renovate them and to how to isolate them properly. And, and, and David, like you said, you know, we, we need enough workforce, but there must be other creative solutions. And those are the kinds that I'm kind of missing still, which aren't all about the grid and about storage, but just for you and me living in our house to straight away start reducing 40% of our energy usage uh, that are innovative. You know, I, I hung up a, a second rail of curtains. I, I would not classify that as super innovative for isolating my house. But, you know, there must be better solutions. How can we, you know, we have tons of houses out there. How can we work with them? And how can we really bring this innovation to people? And not, you know, to the early adopters and innovators, but yeah, th that's something that I'm I'm still looking for. And I, I think is something we also need, but I'm excited about because we know that in times of hardship or in challenge, innovation springs up. So it's just a matter of time now. Kim, do you have a response to that? Yeah, no, fully agree. Um, th th there's... Um... Yeah, there, there is there, there are things which sometimes I, I also think we need to rethink things. I mean, there are also some non-commercial aspect, aspects. I mean, for example, I actually like the current discussion that we should all turn down our heating to like 17, 18 degrees. At Ecosia, uh, we've we've not heated um, um, for for years, and like you just put on a big sweater during the winter, and it works fine. Like people still love to work there. Um, so, so sometimes it's, it's it's really just very simple, and that's non-commercial, not about VC investment or anything, but it's about very simply just rethinking some of the things which we, which we've taken for granted, but then even there, they they just don't make sense. Um, and uh, but but yeah, also also other things which are like low tech, like the curtain is a, is a great example. Um, uh, but also again on the tech side, I, I saw a startup the other day uh, which challenged um, the the conventional thinking: Why should we actually heat every room? We should heat people, not rooms. And I found that very interesting. I, I mean, I don't think they were ready for production, but it's they 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 had something where you, they actually kind of spot on put the heat on uh, whoever was moving that room, and that thing moved with that person. Uh -huh. And I found that a smart thing is like, why are we heating huge rooms if there's one tiny person or two maybe standing in there? Um, good question. And um, so a lot of those things just challenging con conventional thinking and conventional wisdom, um, because that's the only way I think we'll get, get us out of the, the, the climate crisis. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very valid point of just challenging the status quo and just having a bit of a mindset shift with some of these things. Um, we've had a question from the audience, uh, which I'll direct to David. With so much need for integration and collaboration, how applicable would you say open data and open software solutions are to scaling or starting climate tech businesses? I think it's it's great. Huh? So at the end, also what Anne-Marie said, it's all about making innovation accessible to everyone, also in terms of starting a business. Um, and if there's any open source, any open data platform, yeah, just build it or go for it, use it, whatever. Um, but at the end, it's all about building then a product, a solution for a customer. Uh, it's not just about open source is, isn't per se a solution. Uh, it's just like a, a platform that could accelerate your development or shorten time to market. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's great starting with that. And I think so far, Unfortunately, uh, there are not many um, well-known standards, standards, at least in the energy world, that can be used uh, because it's very fragmented. Uh, so um, if there is any good solution or um, innovation or initiative out there, I'm happy also to learn more about that. Yeah, nice. Tim, Anna-Marie, would you add anything on that? 
well, I think sharing knowledge is the only way forward, right? So if there's open data, let's all use it and let's use it together to innovate. I think that's a that that's a, the right approach. And you know, I I think we need to keep in mind like what's the goal? Why are we doing it? And of course, you know, coming back also to the points we raised earlier, it needs to be a viable business and it's not a charity. But let's let's try and drag along as many people as possible and, you know, keep the focus on your company. But if others can benefit from the learnings, please do so. And if that is the case with open data, wonderful. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, David, I also want to ask about something you said before about regulation in the energy world. It's a specific challenge, particularly within Europe. We've talked about that a lot over the last few days, that regulation is so different in different markets. And it's a big challenge, particularly for startup scale-ups. Do you have any kind of insight onto how scale-ups can navigate those challenges? Is there kind of one best way or, yeah. What's your yeah, um, I think certain regulation, of course, you need to accept. Uh, you can't change it. Uh, but I think there are also so many ways starting a business where you don't need to hope that regulation will change soon. Huh? So I think a lot of things are already possible. Uh, but you just need to do it um and so yeah there are like certain markets they're so highly regulated like the balancing or demand response market is for instance uh, in, in in germany at this point it just doesn't make sense to start like a, a very scalable business on top of, top of that uh, it can make sense maybe in two or three years and um, if if it's more like a mass market and also the technology is getting a little bit cheaper and also that the regulation requirements are getting um not not that high anymore um but yeah i think um if we all push uh, the right people and and companies also to change um i think that can help but i think the 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 biggest accelerator that um, regulation is changing are at the moment i would say the high energy prices but also i think every one of us if we demand for certain products and solutions, we also can drive the, um, the change of regulation. <laughs> because if there's a, a market demand, it, it suddenly will work. Uh, and, and I think there, um, there are good good examples. Um, yeah, I think uh, with Tesla, they have built up uh, superchargers very early on along the streets where most of the people said, I, I don't know if it's in, in line with the regulation or not, but they just did it. And of course, they, they found a way to made it in line with the regulation. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's hard, but it's not, not impossible to, to start anything in, in, in regards to that. Yeah. And Tim, do you have any experience with that of kind of balancing regulation or should it, should it foster startups well, or, you know, it, it, it always depends. Um, I mean, there are some, some areas where regulation is your friend and in other cases, your enemy, um, it's, I, I think it's just something, one of the things as a founder, uh, or a company, you need to, uh, make sure that you're networked with the relevant actors, uh, both in politics, but also just have your, your ear, um, close to the close to the developments. And then at some point, yeah, start shaping the discussion by, uh, by being outspoken by, of course, also working with press, um, uh, educating people, uh, in some cases, working with authorities. Um, and I mean, in some areas I see, for example, I see a lot of really positive regulation out of the European Union coming, uh, regulating big tech um, and also regulating big energy in some cases. And um, so there's the, there are some, some very good approaches, um, making sure to, to keep uh, big tech companies in check. Um, and um, and it, it's just, one thing you need to really manage and you need to devote time to and you know to also have a few people on board who really know how regulation works and how to um, be close to um, politicians and regulators uh, and be part of that discussion and not just left out and, and leave the, f the field to the big guys. Yeah, touching on that, I think a tip I'd give people who start a company or who are doing it, you know, Hire experts sometimes. I know, it, it, you know, often you want to do it yourself. You want to learn everything. But especially on the regulatory field, get some help. There's a lot of professionals out there. Partner up. It doesn't have to be very costly. Uh, you know, be vocal, be outspoken. 
but sometimes just hiring advice and getting a person to explain you the regulatory playing field within two hours is going to save you nearly two weeks of research. That's smart times money spent. And, and that's something I'd recommend because regulation is changing. There is an opportunity to influence it. And um, actually, I started my career out in, in public affairs long. <laughs> it feels like decades ago, but I did. And what's interesting is often also on the on the regulatory side, people are very interested in hearing the input from startups and, you know, how innovation could help change it. So uh, don't think that even if you're not too big, you're not a big corporation, you can't make an impact. But by having people help you reach the right p- people who want to listen, you can make that impact. Wise words. Thank you, Anna-Marie. Very helpful. And uh, we've already talked about kind of the the next big things in energy, but Tim, can you give us a little bit of insight into where are the gaps in climate tech? Where do you see kind of future successes? What are the emerging markets? So, um, I mean, one thing we're seeing is that a lot more money, for example, goes into transportation compared to um, transportation's role, really. So, uh, I mean, we all know the the micro mobility, like the e-scooters. Uh, we've we've seen electric vehicles. Um, and that's all good and all positive, but the share of transportation in the global CO2 footprint is actually much smaller than that. So um, uh, we, we need to look beyond that. Uh, I think energy transition is one. There is more and more interest uh, now and uh, with, with the higher energy prices, more and more pressure. Um, the, the one which is really underlooked um, or overlooked and uh, under, underfunded uh, is, is food, agriculture and land use. Um, so anything organic, um, whether that's alternative proteins, whether that's forestry, whether that's um, uh, the, 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 like the, the rebuilding of the soil, so agriculture and uh, enrichment of the soil. So there are a lot of like really interesting things uh, happening uh, on that front uh, where, where I really hope for even more innovation and, and scalable, scalable approaches to decarbonize. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned energy prices there. With those sorts of challenges that come up so spontaneously, how do you think we can best react to them? Should existing companies innovate? Should new companies pop up? Or is that just kind of a short-term problem that you know the bigger companies can deal with? What, how do you think we can deal with these sorts of really sudden changes that we need to respond to quickly? Well, I, I think it's all of the above. The big ones, the small ones, uh, everybody needs to adapt their, their regulators. Um, I, I think... What I really find important is that we abstract from the fact that it's kind of a short-term crisis because otherwise we're in this constant crisis mode. But it's, it's like <clears throat> there's a, a long-term problem with fossil fuels, obviously, um, ecologically, climate change. But there's also economically, it makes no, no sense. I mean, we're paying hundreds of billions as Germany, for example, and, and even more as Europe to, uh, yeah, like... To, to, to ship, uh, ship uh, fossil fuels across the globe, uh, burn it, it's a totally inefficient system, um, pollute the climate, fund um, dictators around the world. It's like, and it's not, it doesn't even make sense for our economy in the long run. So I think abstracting from those short-term things, we need to really think, okay, this is a, a, a long-term problem we need to solve over the next 10 years. And it's, it's very doable with a, with the advances of uh, of renewable energy, and um, and that's what we always, I think, have to keep as the as the north star. And David, what's your perspective on you know balancing those short term and long term goals? Yeah, it's 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 a good question. Um, I think first of all, I think it's important having like this this north star, and then also try to kind of execute very short term on that. Of course, there will be certain very fast changes along the way, but um, I think you just need to get started. And I think uh, just recently we have seen the, the COP27 happening in Egypt. Um, and when I read like the news, what kind of basically Germany did was more um, getting exploration rights for gas fields in, in uh, Senegal and e- Egypt, I guess it was. Uh, so it's yeah, kind of what, what Tim said. Um, and I think that's very short-sighted uh, because um, I think we as we are in in this big crisis and also change and um, 
yeah, it's of course sometimes you need to solve it right now, and there needs to be done some compromises. Of course, there will be like this um, how you say it, uh, this this übergang. I'm just missing like the the English word, but uh, it won't go from from today until tomorrow. So. Um, of course, we we can't uh, switch off fossil fuels uh, tomorrow, but um, I think we need to invest more in renewable solutions. Otherwise, it will be in five years of time the exact same solution uh, the situation again. Um, and I think that's like the the big big balance we need to take. Um, and yeah, I think we can start uh, deciding what kind of heating systems we are buying or using, what kind of car or if we have a car. Uh, what kind of transport we are we're taking. And I think that also can kind of set the direction also then force again, uh, somehow the, the government um, to do certain stuff. Uh, so that's that's kind of my perspective, but I think that's not easy to kind of have the right balance. Yeah. And I think that kind of comes in to education as well. And Tim, you mentioned before, you want to have solutions that even climate change deniers would adopt. How difficult is that educational element of, Kind of telling people that these we need these solutions that renewable energy is good that um all of these things they don't have to sacrifice things in their life um to adopt these clean energy solutions or any kind of clean tech tim um yeah um i mean ed education starts at, at childhood um i mean in, in my case uh, i i think i mean part of why I'm interested in this is because I grew up in Freiburg, which is like a real eco city. And I was involved and active as a teenager in that during that time. And I don't know how I would react to these things today if I wouldn't have done that. So it's, and that's hard to replicate for if you're not, if you haven't grown up uh, like this. Um, so um, as with everything else, I think it's a lot, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of education also of the media. I mean, that's why I hate things like what, what the Springer Presse does uh, on constantly shooting against uh, yeah any anything which is climate friendly just kind of for the sake of being against that for whatever reasons and and so um, it's a hard topic I mean also with social media with recent Twitter takeover all those things it's um, it's something I'm definitely concerned about because if if you don't if you're not able to educate people then it's just a super uphill battle and I I don't know it's like Anna Marie, what do you think? Is like that's that's it's one of the hardest questions. It, um, it is one of the hardest questions, and now having children myself, I think it you, you even see it even clearer. You know, mm -hmm. um, maybe I think start with yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, start walking the talk. So that means that you know, True. start leading by example. Start talking about it. Start start addressing it. And I know it sounds very basic and maybe small and of course you know we want to make major impact but I think it starts also with you and how we act and what we demand and and David you know also what we demand for products you know what what, what we ask so start with those kind of things um to educate but also I think um and that's something we should be careful about is not to only think in our you know, eco bubble, eco European bubble, maybe even because there are a lot of other people who have very different hardships, and climate change is really not one of them because they're thinking about how to feed their children, and you know, going to get their children to school, and um, uh, and I do think it's it's very important to be mindful of that, um, because I think we need to bring everyone along. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anna Marie. And we only have a few more minutes. So I'd like to just kind of ask you each if you could wish for one thing that would change or the new that would come in the clean tech space, what would it be? Hard question, Tim, starting with you. So if I have one thing, I think it'd really be, be the wish for regulation to set a proper CO2 price across everything, like no exceptions, no loopholes, everybody, like, 200 euros or something per ton. Of course, making sure that that poor households, um, uh, I, I agree with you, what you just said, Anna-Marie, on, on that one, um, uh, that poor households uh, basically get, um, 
get reimbursed for that or or the uh, the respective social security is increased uh, so that that they uh, don't suffer but on the other side there's no reason if if i want to heat my uh, house uh, and i decide to live in a certain amount size house then there's no reason that i shouldn't pay for that um but so there's a clear there's a there's, there's a clear pricing across everything um uh, including also removing all the respective subsidies because that then and bringing this back to the startup question, that would really uh, that that would let thousands of startups bloom, um, which then suddenly have solutions which actually make real economic sense, um, uh, because uh, polluting the environment and the climate suddenly isn't free anymore. So then the rest would be done by um, by entrepreneurs, and so that's that's really the one thing I think uh, which would need, need to happen. Anna Marie, what about you? It's a very hard question. One thing that you could wish in the tech space. Uh, I, I, I wish that I have is that, you know, le, le, and maybe it sounds very um, broad and sensitive, but I really wish that we we think of how can we now get innovation down as fast as possible to the masses? You know, how can we bring the, the climate tech innovations, the energy innovations that are there to everyone? Uh, and that's also bearing in mind, I think, the crisis is which we face now. So that, that I, I'd have a wish, you know, I'd wish for some technology to come down raining fast, you know, if and, and, and being supported maybe by governments or by a big visionaries. But Greta, it's a very good question, and I and maybe I should get it, write a blog about it and and get back to you on this one. Well, I look forward to reading your blog then, <laughs> after you've had a little bit more time to think about it. Uh, David, what about you? Well, I, I think Tim 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 did a pretty good one with the C two prize. Um, I think at the end, it's it's all about um, making um, sustainable carbon neutral product as, as cheap and as reliable that everyone can kind of afford it. And I think it's not that only like at the end, climate deniers are, are buying these kind of products and solutions. I think it should be just the best. Uh, it's the cheapest and the best. And I think uh, we can really work on that. It's like a wish I have in a, in a, in a long run uh, that there is no other solution because it's the best and the cheapest. So everyone is kind of buying in it and using it. Um, and also, I think on a, on a short term, what I what would wish for is it's not kind of directly connected to um, a clean tech. It's more about that. I would say the the carbon heavy lifestyle is not that cool anymore. Obviously, because if I browse through Instagram, I just see like a person X Y Z is flying to Australia and then to that and, and using a private chat and I don't know what. Uh, so that's um, for a lot of kids like the cool stuff. Um, and I think that's unfortunately not the best way how we can save our planet. Um, so I think there, yeah, maybe that that other social media platforms are rising up where more like a green uh, lifestyle is is cool and not like this carbon heavy one. Maybe that's the next big thing. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, totally agree. Um, really interesting perspectives. Thank you all so much for the really insightful discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground there. Um, you know, a lot of mindset change needed, education, regulation, innovation. So um, yeah, a lot going on. Thank you, Tim and Anna Marie. I uh, hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks, David. Yep. And we'll be back in two minutes two. talking about uh, e-mobility. <laughs>